um, <clears throat> I guess tell me a little bit about um, the the rudiments of a mission. How long, like for instance, how long did the average? Well, you were on three. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, very long. not very long. But uh, you got you said uh, on the second mission, you guys got a like, well, you guys didn't get the call to abort. Yeah. But where 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 was that mission to? Where were you? I have no idea. I have no idea. You don't know where you guys were going? No, no. <laughs> I didn't know where the first one was either. I knew it was over France, but the, the, the other information wasn't necessary for me to know. So they didn't brief you on that part of it when they. No. Well, we were in the briefing. Mm -hmm. It showed, you know, it showed the ribbon, showed where the, where the, where to go. But other intensive briefings, I guess, was with the pilots mm -hmm. going over maps and things like that, navigator. No, we didn't get any briefing on it. What was it like, I guess, to uh, get the planes together? Because I think that's pretty unique, and that's that's something that I think most people aren't aware of, and you'll never see again these huge armadas. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I told I it was all done with flares, and we had this gun that I I would shoot. We had certain flares. Our squadron. Had a color, say yellow or blue or whatever, whatever our color was for that day. And when you get above the clouds and all of these planes are lining up on each other, as they go along, they shoot a flare, and you watch for your color. So when you see your color, that's the way you go. And you join in and take a position in any square that that they had, and. Uh, when everybody was lined up, and they stream out over the over the, uh, the channel. Ours ours was unique in as much as it was a ridiculous mission. We we took off, flew over the channel, went north around Holland. We could see the the Finger Lakes or whatever that is, like Finger Island, around the top of Holland, then in, across Denmark. In, in Denmark, we received flak from the Germans who had occupied it, so they already knew we were coming around there. And then we headed out over the Baltic and headed south again towards North Germany. And as we approached North Germany, the word went out, fighters, you know, 12 o'clock or 2 o'clock, whatever the heck it was later. And I could see them. They weren't coming out in the formation, but my D 50, 60 little dots. And then off, way off to my left, I could see this B-17 end over end, wing over wing, going down. And everybody's yelling over the intercom, see any parachutes? See any parachutes? <laughs> no, we didn't see any parachutes. And, this, uh, and then after the attack, the radios were out, and you didn't hear anything. But you were so concentrated, you didn't even know the radio was out. But the, the reticle went out, and I had to fire at what I thought was proper time. And the only time that that came up is when their wings lit up. I fired, because I thought they, if they were close enough to fire at me, I, I could hit them. So I was trying everything. Firing this way, holding down, and sort of sweeping across them, sweeping across. You know, there were four or five of them lined up be behind us. And they just stood there and, and uh, shot us down. So, uh, so much for your uh, training in shooting down fighters. <laughs> I thought it was uh, quite a stupid mission, to tell you the truth. So, uh, you know, a lot of people were hurt and captured for uh, something that almost, you know, where were we going when we reached Posen? Either Russia or, or uh, Sweden. Couldn't get back. Do you know what the mission was for? Or what were they targeting? The Fakuo factory. Whether they ever got there or not, I'll never know. <laughs> I might think. They probably have it in the archives of what happened, but uh, it was a disaster. And they had another 500 planes going for Berlin that day, too. So uh, that 
what is he, 80, I guess. 80 is 800 men. <laughs> I mean, you in Iraq, you hit one guy, two guys, three guys, 800 men in one shot. And this is going on every day. They were flying every day. Well, it must have had some impact on the war, I'm sure. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, anyhow. Oh, I think you guys were the ones that did it. Yeah, I don't know. In a big way, because uh, that's the one thing, I think, that's that's the one thing that uh, that we could do to them that they couldn't do to us. Yeah. We could wipe out their ability to produce the material. That's right. I always said that we had the two best generals in the world, General Electric and General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It's the same as the Civil War. They lost it when they started because the North had all of the production and everything. They had the immigrants coming in from Ireland by the ton to replace. The South didn't have a chance. They were growing cotton. Yeah, they were out, 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 uh, out manufactured. That's right. They got the repeating rifles in there and everything else. So that's what it amounts to when you look at history. We had a we had a beautiful country here turning out the, the women were working and everybody was working and the planes were flying off the the ships were coming out before they could sink them all. So you know it's that's one of those things. They never learned. <laughs> no, no. Well they were that yeah, you know, I always thought that was kind of an interesting lesson about that war the war in general, that uh it's it's not the guys it's not the biggest military that wins the war. No, it's no. the biggest it's the biggest economy that's that right. always wins. That's and right. Napoleon it was the same thing. You know, the British beat Napoleon because they were they were a nation of shopkeepers, like you said, <laughs> <laughs> and they could buy whatever they needed to keep fighting. And Napoleon was 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 done for. Yeah, right. But yeah, well, off track on that, but I guess. Um, Uh, well, yeah, we pretty much covered. I guess the last mission uh, that you guys were on, so that was the one that closed. And, uh, oh, um, I wanted to ask also, is as the top, since you were the top turret gunner as the engineer, was it your role to call out fighters? If you, were you the everybody's team? role was to call out fighters if they saw them, whoever saw them, call them out. But you kind of had the best, or did you have the best position? I guess in a way. Oh, I think so. I think so. I swiveled all around, and unless it came up from from below, but they never did. They usually up in the sun or someplace. Who knows where <laughs> these fighters used to come through? <laughs> think about prison camp, and it, and, it, and this is true. I think it was in the picture about 17B. There was an airfield about two miles away from our prison camp that was bombed. And, uh, and the fighters used to knew that we were a uh, air force camp, and they used to buzz us in the morning. So the guys would get out with rocks in the morning. <laughs> they come down trying to hit the. <laughs> so they put up a sign: <laughs> anyone throwing rocks at the aircraft will be shot without notice. <laughs> and the other sign was: American prisoners of war. Escaping is no longer a sport. You will be shot without notice. <laughs> We were nasty to that. <laughs> Abe Wallace showed me that flyer. I don't know if you know Abe. Uh, he was at the show. A what? Uh, the flyer that they gave, I guess they had issued a decree saying that. Uh, no, it was a sign. It was a sign. Yeah. In, the, in the ground. <laughs> it's no longer a sports book. So. They had uh, the fellow that used to have the roll call. He'd be called out several times, sometimes a day. Snow and everything else, and he he'd come up in the morning and he'd, we called him Peg Leg. He lost a leg in in Russia someplace, and he was Captain Peg Leg. <laughs> and he'd come out in the morning and he'd say Good Morgan, you know, and everybody would say Good Morgan. And then the SS came by one day and changed all of that. And in the morning he came out. Good morning, he gives the Nazi salute, and everybody says, Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then they got mad at us because we were throwing snowballs at them. Everybody had a snowball, we said, Good morning. <laughs> we were nasty. 
I had a tunnel under my under my bed. I slept in the same uh, structure as the uh, head of the, my compound, Chester Shattuck. He's dead too now, and uh, he was the head man in our section. And they had they cut through the two by twelves under the bed and started the tunnel there. And the different ways we found of getting rid of the sand and everything was remarkable. We 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 brought everybody had diarrhea and things. They kept walking back and forth to the latrine. So they took the, the pocket with sand and pulled a string and, and, and the sand would fall. <laughs> and they found out there was more sand in the latrines than anything else when the guy came through with the honey wagon. And then, so they they decided they were going to throw it in when they, they had this big basin in the middle of the barracks where we washed. And the water would be running there. And we'd take the sand, we'd throw it in, in there and drain it out. And they had a little mess of growing on the outside of the camp. And the sand was piling up like in New Orleans. You know? <laughs> so they, they cut off our water. And they gave us water only a certain time of day. No more running water all the time. And that was it. Then the Red Cross sent us seeds for growing vegetables, carrots, radishes, or whatever. So we planted them. And we had to rake it up, you know, and turn the soil and everything else. And while we were turning the soil, we're dropping the, the dropping from the tunnel. <laughs> no, no more vegetables. <laughs> and then we had two tunnels going. And we wanted them to find one. So we found one, and we take the soil from the other one and fill up the whole tunnel. Uh, Now you guys got caught, I guess, uh, near the Baltic in Germany. Just yeah, on the on the German coast. It must have been if we'd have flying flown another five minutes, or who knows, two minutes, we'd have been into those trees because we were heading south. So it was lucky that we ditched it south. But uh, between the fog and everything else, the pilot did a fantastic job. And who, originally you guys, you said uh, civilians got you guys? Volkstrom, People's Army or whatever. There was, they weren't in uniform, but they had shotguns and uh, they, were, they were patrolling the coast. We were lucky because a lot of airmen got killed outright, I guess, by farmers and... You, you hear that, I don't know. I don't know how true that is, but it probably does happen. Especially if you got a relative that you killed the night before. <laughs> And you guys were turned over. At what point were you guys turned over to the Luftwaffe? Uh, well, the, the guy that interrogated me wasn't the Luftwaffe. The, uh, the prison war camp was the, you know, even while in this, uh, while we were being this place I called the Kvetch Moor, the squeeze mill that we knew about. We knew about it even before we got to, to, uh, to Germany. Uh, it, it was a, we knew where the uh, Gestapo was and where the railroad was and where the trolley car ran and different things like that. So it uh, we knew a lot about it, but uh, actual being <laughs> it's a lot different. The Kvetch I remember that. The squeeze mill. They had a model of a B-17. I guess it was for our benefit. Uh, about this big. With the different cones of fire from the plane in plastic, so they know exactly what they were up against, you know. And uh, that they knew more about our plane than we did. And uh, so they they made it appear that they knew you, where you came from, and things like that. You know, they gave that they tried to give that opinion that they knew everything about you. So why not? You know, tell them what, what they want to know. Didn't work much, though. No. Apparently. Just kept your mouth shut and you wouldn't even put your foot in it, that's all. I wouldn't tell them. First of all, I'm trucking. Secondly, I didn't know a damn thing. <laughs> they knew where we were going. Of course, they got the bombs. They knew more than you guys did. That's right. But uh, what are they going to ask me? Where were you going?
and they probably knew our squadron, they probably knew our squadron commander, and they, all of these things they might probably know. Did you have all your interrogation initially, or did they, they send you to Dumas, it looks like it's near Frankfurt, or? That's what I'm talking about, the French Moulin, the Dumas Louf in Frankfurt. That's the place with all of the glass out of the framework. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you see, did you see the city itself? No. You never saw any of the city? No. You never saw the damage of the bombs or anything like that? Just the railroad station was, was shattered. Uh, there must have been bombs real close by that didn't hit. But the, all the glass was, you know, one of these glass rotundas. And there wasn't a single plate piece of glass in them. So things were going on all around. Did you feel anything at that time when you saw that? The bombs, uh, I guess it did? Well, yeah, we were always in awe of what we were seeing. <laughs> <laughs> they, not plenty of them didn't didn't hit the tire because it was carpet bombing, more or less. The lead guy would let go and everybody else would let go and, and it was just carpet bomb. Unless they had a specific orders for something else, I don't know. They weren't too accurate. They didn't care. Just kill Germans. We used to yell, women and children first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, how we hated them. Did you really feel a really strong hatred at the time? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But the Germans that I met, sort of, it wore off a little bit. We had an Austrian guard. That used to come in all the time. He was a likable guy, you know. He's one of the guys. <laughs> he'd take his gun out. He'd take the clip out and the bullets, and he'd show us the gun, pistol. And in the end result, he got us a camera and took pictures for us. Even Dunkel was his name, Dunkel. And I think they killed him when when we were. Somebody must have shot him after we were released. The French were pulling all of the Germans into the forest at the time and knocking them off, whatever they could find. But uh, we ended up in a uh, <laughs> in a forest on the Inns River, uh, where the Inns meet the Salts, Salts River, Salzburg, I believe it was. And we were, the, the, uh, they put us into the field and we started to take apart the trees, the bark on all the trees, we peeled the bark of all of the trees, <laughs> the forest we killed all the trees. And we used the bark to make lean-tos. And uh, we put up our own latrine. We got a couple of trees together in a row and built a ditch and we sit on the on the uh, on the tree, you know, and do whatever you had to do. And uh, they dumped a pile of potatoes for us. And from this uh, forest, one day up drives a jeep with an American sergeant and another guy in it. And you're liberated. <laughs> so that's when the fun began. They went into town, they got the fire engine and ran it. <laughs> and I went, I went to this house. We were wandering around. First we lined up the Germans. And they all stood there. We, they emptied their pockets and they put their guns down. And they were prisoners. But uh, the jeep kept going. So we were sort of in a, in a lawless area there. These guys we were all looking for food. So I went to this farmhouse. There's this little old frail lady in there. And she was shaking like a leaf. And she comes up. Uh, I said, Essen, Essen. So uh, she got me an egg, and I ate the egg, a little piece of bread, and here comes this Ruski. Then she started to shake. She was terrified. They, you know, they, they look like Mongolians, you know, with the, with the slanted eyes and the ear laps. They look, they, they scared me, I tell you. A Cossack. Yeah, something like that. Eh? Some from Mongolia, though. So he came to the door and he knocks on the door and I said, just a minute. I said, yeah, Ruski, roused, <laughs> roused. So I chased him away. <laughs> he 
then you went into these houses around it, it was all all things that belonged to families that were gone, you know, it was a horrible thing be, to be in between lawlessness and and then there were there were always trout in the streams in Austria. So we had the German rifles. And I was shooting at chickens too. <laughs> I could could hit one and he took off and flew for about fifty yards. I never saw a chicken fly before. <laughs> And then we, we got to the stream where there were, you could see the trout in there. So we'd shoot at the trout. You didn't have to hit them. And if you just came close to them, they'd turn up and a shock knocked them out. So the guy would be downstream with his pants rolled up. And as the fish flows by, he'd grab them. <laughs> it was against the law of the fish with them there. <laughs> but no more. Be good fish. Yeah, and then, then the year. Uh, they, uh, the tank came through, there was some cigarettes and whatever, and we went to this uh, factory rounds where we slept on the ground and until uh, the trucks picked us up and took us to uh, La Havre. People of France were yelling, they were yelling, people of France. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that ride on the truck was something, but everything was destroyed, everything was destroyed. And then uh, we, they put us on a boat and uh, ship, and we went from La Havre, we went across to England, where we docked. And they were, the Aussies were unloading German prisoners with a bullwhip. They were running through the, off the boats with the water on land, you know, snapping that whip. And then they got a call through on, the, on our ship. All, all, all prisoners of war, turn in your blankets. The German prisoners need blankets. So we threw them all overboard. <laughs> and the ship pulled out into the uh, into the bay before it went. Here comes this rowboat with a bunch of GIs on it. And they go to the, near the kitchen, the door is open on the side of the ship. Got any eggs, got any eggs. <laughs> I guess they were selling one black mile. So we gave them a case of eggs. And we were eating eggs, like we hadn't had eggs in uh, all the time, over a, year, over a year. So we were tapping them and drinking them, tapping and drinking the eggs. Why the show? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was anything like that. <laughs> and uh, as the boat took off to New York, the war ended in Europe. So we didn't know whether the U-boats knew about it or not. So we slept on deck. <laughs> but we, we got time. It was nice coming home. In the Narrows in Brooklyn, they had the uh, Rockettes, something like that. Welcome home, and they were dancing. It was very nice to get home. What was your, what was your feeling? Because I'm assuming you went to New York Harbor and you were back to that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, what were you feeling? What was it? Well, we were excited. <laughs> we were excited. We docked, docked in Manhattan, and was on a gas tank, it was a big sign, "Welcome home." And uh, then we got went across, uh, seemed like on a train, on a, tra on a ferry across, went back to New Jersey, down to uh, what's the big army base in New Jersey? Uh, down south. I forget the name of it. Anyhow, they said, uh, do you want to work through the night? Or do you want to uh, <laughs> wait until tomorrow? He said, let's work through the night. And they had German prisoners serving us food there, you know. So they were taking, oh, white bread, white bread, you know. So it was just, no, nah, no, nah, not healthy. Strasbourg, black bread. <laughs> but it was funny having the, the German prisoners serve us there. That, that affected us a little bit. <laughs> Back, you know? Yeah, they were they were doing pretty good. <laughs> they were feeding us. What did you do after the war? <sighs> got out, didn't have a job, got married. <laughs> uh, after all that mail back and forth and everything else, I got married and. My brother arranged for me to get married at the uh, St. George Hotel. That was the only place that had meat. <laughs> you 
you know, you couldn't get any meat in those days. And I was married there, and I spent the first night in the tower of St. George Hotel, and then I went off to a place called uh, Staroon Manor, upstate New York, on my honeymoon. And then the uh, Air Force gave me uh, a, uh, a week in New Jersey on the South Shore. And uh, what's that name? That's the big Jersey. Uh, no, I forget the name of the town. It's a big town. Oh, Atlantic City? Atlantic City. <laughs> I'm not sure I remember that. Let's see, I'm getting old. Uh, Atlantic City, and we put up at this hotel. It was just a beautiful to stop fishing and everything else. And I went down to the uh, to the doctor there, and I said uh, I had astigmatism because of malnutrition. And they gave said to me a pair of glasses, pick them up in the afternoon. I went back down. I was discharged. I went down to pick my glasses. They wouldn't go to see, so I thought I was already discharged. <laughs> And then they gave me uh, a, a check for not much, and uh, I went home. And for a while, I didn't know what to do. I met another gentleman who was a friend of, a lady friend of my wife's, who was a prisoner of war on B 24s. And we decided to go into the trucking business. And uh, we went all the way up to West Point, New York, to buy a chassis. His uncle was a roaster under the Brooklyn Bread Coffee Roaster. So they needed somebody to pick up uh, beans, coffee beans. Well, in those days, they had these Mack trucks with the chains on the bottom. They used to carry 100 bags of coffee at a time to the roasters. But there were a lot of people that little independent companies that had coffee roasted and had their own brands. So they would send in the tin cans with their name on it, and they would roast it and put it into their cans for them. So it was, a, it was open to us because we could pick up three bags here, two bags there, and we, we got to be known around, around the waterfront, you know, the kids they called us. And we'd pull up, and the guy would take two hooks, and he'd throw the stuff into our truck, and we'd pick up small lots here and there, and that served a purpose for them. And uh, we'd take it back to the roaster, and uh, we paid, I think, 30 cents a, a pound or something like that in the coffee bag. And uh, one day, we had these guys, he, he weighed and checked them up their top, throws an extra bag in, there's a meat outside. <laughs> oh, I'm with the mob. <laughs> so I, I didn't stop. I, I went in and I told the roaster what happened. You know, don't worry about it. So <laughs> after a while, we, uh, I got another contract with the Indian Orchard Finishing Company. There's tubular textiles all over the city. They, they have these uh, knitters working, manufacturing this tubular. And they used to take it from the platform, also under the Brooklyn Bridge. They'd come in there with a trailer every morning. Uh, I used to go out and pick, and uh, I got so well known with these people that they had keys to all their factories. So before they came in, I would come and pick up the stuff. I'd pick up the rolls of fabric, and I bought another truck with a metal body in it. APCO alarm system and everything else, and uh, a new Ford with a new body. And we contracted with them, and I was picking up the piece goods, bringing it back to the platform. The trailer would come in the morning with the stuff they were returning. So I'd take the stuff on, load it up, take it out to the people, give, it, give them that, and then pick up just back and forth like that. So that was two. Then we decided we wanted to stretch a little bit. So we bought another truck and we got a contract with the Maybrook Bedding Company, manufactured mattresses and uh, Fred took that truck and I had the Indian Orchard truck and we hired another man to drive the other truck. We had 
the, uh, the ferry truck was on general freight to pick me up freight for, for the company that was uh, operating out of that platform. They needed somebody to pick up freight. So we had three trucks and Indian Orchard would not let me off the truck because, you know, they, they insisted that I be on the truck. I said, I, you know, I can't grow if I'm going to sit here on this truck all the time. So uh, I said to Fred, I said, Fred, we're not going to go anywhere with, the, with these people. I said, look, let me out here. I'll get out. So I left, left them with everything. I just walked away. And there was no, you know, didn't know me anything, just walked away. I, I felt bad enough about it, but I could see that it wasn't going anywhere. And then a relative of mine found out that I wasn't doing anything and knew that I was mechanically inclined. He heard about uh, this thing from California, vertical blinds. And what it was at that time was a hook on the top and a hook on the bottom and a grove ring living between them. And you turn the rod on the end just to rotate them. They didn't traverse or anything. And this company out west was advertising sun vertical. So uh, he and his, uh, this person that, that came to me and his brother used to be in a dress business, but, but they saw this thing in the Times and they said they'd try it with the vertical blinds. And nobody knew what a vertical blind Never saw it before. And uh, so I started installing for them. The first, the first day he hired me, takes me out at night to hang this thing up. Mm -hmm. I go, holy mackerel! I was drilling a hole in brick and everything. Else. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And the people were happy with it. So, uh, and time went along. They liked to play golf and do this and do that. And uh, so. It, it, after a while, it turned out that I would come in in the morning, I'd go out and sell a job, come back, make it up, go back and install it in the afternoon and get paid, and that's it. So I, by them being that lazy, I, I learned a lot about the business. And I did all of the work. I, I made all of the blinds. Actually, it was prefabricated, but I cut, cut it up to size, and, and I developed a system where I could cut the back of the track and bend it. So that it went into these bow windows that were getting quite popular at that time. And uh, one of the builders decided to use us on all of his uh, show houses, you know, the, the model. model homes, yeah. And uh, the way I did that window was just beautiful, you know. And that sold a lot of their houses. Well, at any rate, this went on for a couple of years. And, decide, uh, and they got a contract with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, the Chase Manhattan Bank in Manhattan. He had developed a, a, uh, a sliding track. And the louvers were seven inches wide on these lines as compared to what you see today. And uh, they got the contract for a 60 story building, which I ran tons and tons of bottom weights going up the outside elevator of the building. Before the windows were in, we had the tracks up and everything. And that was power stars, but with that kind of... Right. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have the power uh, tools at that time. At any rate, uh, Skidmore decided they, were, they weren't going to... They used us on several jobs, they weren't going to do it anymore. So they figured that's the end of vertical lines and Skidmore stopped. And that was actually the beginning. <laughs> So they wanted to sell. Who can they sell to? I knew the business, and nobody else would, knew anything about them at that time. So they made a deal with me where uh, they wanted $40,000 or something. Which wasn't that much. At that time, it was, though. So uh, there was a kid that, I, that they hired to help me out. So I said, you want to go into business? I said, you got any money? <laughs> so he had some IBM stock that his father had, and he, he, he used that money to, uh, to get to raise some money. And I raised some money, and my brother loaned me $10,000. And 
which at the end, <laughs> they decided they want, uh, what do they call it? The money uh, put up in escrow. Oh, okay. Another $10,000. So that's really screwed everything up. So at any rate, we bought the business from them. And uh, it did very well, you know, for a while. And uh, I didn't want skid mowing the barrel anymore because they never looked at the product, the product they made. They never looked at the owner's uh, problems with maintenance. And things. Everything had to be beautiful and everything, but not work. And uh, so I had some big jobs in a bank in Tennessee and uh, the hospital in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, Roanoke Valley Hospital. And uh, we went along like that for a while. And then finally, uh, I decided to retire. <laughs> so I sold the business to the young man, whatever it was. And we came to an agreement. And he paid me out of a period of time. And then we ended up here. So everything's OK. Meanwhile, I had a daughter and a son. And she's a nurse. And he's a uh, psychologist. Two bright kids. <laughs> And uh, they have their children, would you be honest? <laughs> How old is she, by the way? God, I don't know. A hundred, I think. <laughs> <laughs> She's so, so far ahead. I'm going to see them in Atlanta. That's great. Yeah. But I, I got these two boys now that uh, Matthew is very smart and really knows what he's doing. And, Knows where he's heading and knows what he wants. He applied to school and he's done it and everything. So with this hundred percent disability, I can I can help. And uh, Jason is older and he works for uh, Puck. Uh, oh, okay. Wolfgang Puck. He's a oh, cook, okay. but I want him to go to uh, the culinary school. So uh, today's Monday. Tomorrow he's, I'm supposed to take him there. Go which to, one, uh, the one up here in, uh, in Lauderdale? Okay. Oh, the, which the Art Institute? Or? I don't know what it is. I have I have the slightest idea. I know what you're talking. Which about. one is the good one? Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> the one I always heard about is the one that's down, but it's way down on 125th Street in Dade, in Miami. Oh, I don't think he's one of those. No, because he has to work, yeah. and uh, Puck is. He, he, he told Puck he's quitting. You know, he wants to go to school. So they wouldn't let him quit. They gave him a raise. I said, that's the worst thing that could have happened to you. That raise is the worst thing that could have happened. You'd be happy with the money now, but they'll train you. They'll put you in a position. And with the credentials that you have, you can work anywhere. So we'll see what that does. If he can do both, it's great. Yeah. Although if he doesn't they're have they're going to allow him to work while he goes. So that's good. And because his father has emphysema, he get he might get some other help from someone. Uh, what I wanted to I wanted to cover a couple of other things and then we'll, we'll do my time, just in the specific areas uh, in the questions. And stuff. But um, getting back to uh, seventeen, I know we're going back quite a bit now. <laughs> but um. Do you remember your arrival at Krems at 17? That yeah. Day? Yeah. I told, uh, well, they, the train pulled up and there was the, the German soldiers who jumped off out of the, out of the freight cars. And uh, he was yelling and telling us that we would be shot, and shot, that we would be shot, that we would be shot, that we could try to do this and do that. And the dogs were howling and screaming and, and tearing at each other. And uh, he's yelling, Verdammt Hund! <laughs> Do something to the dogs in German, he was yelling. And the guys, the dogs fighting, fight amongst themselves. And this, this guy goes in to try to pull them apart, and one of them bites him on the arm, and everybody's giggling. <laughs> Just so happy. <laughs> Did you feel like kind of at that point, uh, well, these guys are not going to be too, uh, you know, too, too. I, I never, I, it's strange. I never did worry too much about it. 
after, you know, after my first meeting with that major or colonel or whatever he was up in uh, near Statine and uh, you know, near, on the Gulf Coast, uh, we always we always uh, walked with our head high, and uh, we didn't act like prisoners. We like, like we acted like we were better than they were. <laughs> it's the truth. We'd stand in front of them and with their long coat, you know, and you're a superman, huh? <laughs> and we'd have a cigarette. We had plenty of cigarettes for some reason. And we'd be smoking, we'd be standing at one guy standing on the other side, and you want a cigarette? And, and he'd, he'd reach for it and he'd hand it to the other guy. You know, it was sort of nasty stuff. It, it would have killed us. <laughs> Played a lot of psychological games. Yeah, the only time they scared me was when it came through the barracks drunk. Then you didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know. Yeah. Did that happen often? It happened once that I that I was at, but I, I don't I didn't like that at all. Of <laughs> course, you never knew what the hell they were going to do. What did they do? Nothing. They were just going through and. Uh, What were your fellow prisoners like? Well, we all went about our business in our own way. We had to keep clean, to do our laundry. To, uh, we ate together, you know, and uh, it was... How, what did I, I don't know. They all had ideas of what they wanted to do after the war. This one guy, Lindemeyer, came from out west somewhere. Another one wanted to go to Alaska after the war. And uh, didn't talk too much about it. It was just, uh, what can we do to annoy them? To annoy them. You know, the guy that came through, this guy Dunkel, got us a crystal set. So we, we had the... Uh, the news all the time, what was going on, and, and if anybody came, he'd eat, he'd eat the paper. So, uh, one guy would stand outside and watch. But they, I, I guess the Germans knew what to do. <laughs> but what the hell? As long as we did, as long as we didn't escape on them, they were they were happy. Did they ever plant uh, spies? I guess among you guys. Or? Not that I know of. Not that I know. Of. Yeah, that possible. Was, that's possible. That was a big part of the movie. Kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's Hollywood. <laughs> Actually, you know, it was pretty funny in most of it, but it was funnier in camp. We had one guy, every time we have a roll call, he'd come out with a cowboy hat, you know, and he's like he was riding a horse. <laughs> and then we had the air raid on Krems, which was a scary thing for us because we didn't know what was going to happen to us because we're right in that town. And we stood up there and watched the bombs come down. And if you were inside the building, the main beam would go. <laughs> and you could actually hear the bombs going through the air. And they, they knocked the hell out of the railroad station, and the oil tank or whatever that was there. And the people came out and tried to pick up the dead or wounded. Every, and P-38s came over. And it was like, Oil in the, in the frying pan with butter with the water shower, you know that that pop 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 pop, and they were machine gunning down the down the. Uh, so we felt pretty bad about that. And then they they came in and took glass from our windows. We put cardboard up, but replaced some of the windows. And there's a plaque in Krems now talking about the people who were killed at that raid, and how uh, the fruitless war is. Well, poor Austria was dragged, <laughs> kicking, screaming into that thing because of them. Poor Austria, they were there. Well, she was pretty happy at the time. I yeah, think. yeah, they sure. Were on the street celebrating with him. The Fuhrer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he was Austrian anyway. That's right. Yeah. Bastard. Oh, evil. Unbelievable. In his last days in his bunker, he was still ranting at the Jews. <laughs> we were lucky we weren't all killed. Because he had issued something about killing us, but 
they didn't do it. I think at that point, probably you wouldn't be getting a lot of decision making anymore. I think they were in a bunker there. He thought he had armies, he didn't have them. The Russians were rolling him up, something. Well, when we were in, in, in France, when the Russians were nearing Vienna at night, you could hear that crescendo of artillery. It was amazing. And lights, you know, flickering on it. That was uh, 20 miles, 25 miles away. You could hear that. It's like thunder. And we left. We just left. <laughs> One thing the Red Cross gave us is plenty of toilet paper. So you can always tell where we stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh boy. Do you remember uh, any specific besides uh, Duckel? Um, do you remember uh, any specific guards? Yeah, there was one that used to be Max Schmeling's sparring partner. They said he was a big guy, but uh, Duckel was the one that used to come through the barracks all the time. Very nice. Poor Austrian. <laughs> With glasses, everything. He was harmless. Was there really a guard named Schultz? No, there, there, there's, uh, could be Dunkel <laughs> <laughs> or Holmes. And um, I guess overall, you were you were treated uh, reasonably well. But. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Uh, we weren't treated, you know. We had our rutabagas for, <laughs> for breakfast. No, they had some kind of a oat or something for breakfast, and then for lunch we'd have rutabagas. And black bread or potato, no meat, no eggs, no onions, no vegetables, and augmented by uh, Red Cross parcels, which were very, very thin because they were bombed out of their skull. And, they, and probably when they knew that Red Cross parcels were there, they, they grabbed them themselves. But they were very infrequent. Did you guys, uh, George Harris mentioned uh, maggot stew? Oh, yes, not maggot stew. Black, black eyed peas. Black eyed peas. We got a bunch of those ones. There. Hey, Joe, look at those peas. There were little weevils in each pea. <laughs> These guys, what the hell is, you know, it's like eating meat. <laughs> we ate it. <laughs> Even you're hungry. What they used to give us some cheese sometimes, you swear. It was right out of the, uh, the toilet. You know, <laughs> what a smell that. And we used to get margarine, cans of Italian margarine that we used to open up and put a wick in <laughs> and burn it as a lamp. They used them as candles. Yeah. Oh boy. Is it still working? 